So I was told that I had to give a, uh, a lightning talk with a provocative title. So I decided to uh, ask the question, are uh, VMs passe? Are VMs dead? No. So anyway, thank you for, for coming to this talk. <laughs> but um, if you ask a slightly different question, which is, is there a better alternative for many use cases and environments? You, you, know, you, just, you just heard Luke give a fantastic description of what the environment looks like today. And it's very different than the environment uh, that the world looked like when the VM was created. And so if you're talking about application management and creation, if you're talking about moving things across clusters and clouds, if you're talking about a continuous integration, continuous development environment, if you're talking about how do I build scale out apps or how do I do high performance things or how do I get that nice collaboration happening between devs and ops, you know, people who are fundamentally uh, wired differently and yet how do you get them to work together? Um, there is a better answer, uh, and, and the answer is containers. And, um, but I'll start by, by trying to summarize what has changed since the, you know, since the dark ages, since, since the VM was created. And you know, when, when, the, when the VM was created, there were at least three things that you would kind of count on. Um, you could count on applications that were going to live a long time. Uh, you know, six months, a year, five years. Uh, that was sort of the software development lifecycle that you were dealing with. Um, secondly, those applications were monolithic, uh, and they were built on a single stack. Um, and the third thing is that they were deployed to a single server. So, you know, the VM was invented when our problem was, hey, I've got a single purpose, uh, you know, Microsoft Exchange server and a single purpose um, Mac print server and a single purpose Linux inventory app. And I want to, you know, take all those single purpose physical servers and consolidate them all on one, uh, on one server. Well, the world has changed. Now development is iterative and constant. Applications uh, are, yeah, development, uh, if you see one of the latest surveys that came out from the 451 group, um, over 40% of all organizations deploy daily or more frequently, uh, and two-thirds deploy uh, weekly or more frequently, and um, at least 20% are deploying more frequently than daily. So this is a big change. Um, applications aren't monolithic anymore. They're built from lots of loosely coupled components um, that are themselves built on lots of different stacks and that are constantly changing. And of course, applications aren't deployed to a single server. Uh, they're deployed to multitudes of servers. And you know, there's one aspect of this, which is that somehow the application that is written uh, and working on a developer's laptop needs to move from there to testing, to, to pre-prod, to staging, to production. Um, and people want that to take seconds or minutes, not weeks or months. Um, and once it's in production, you want to be able to scale it. You want to be able to do what, what Pinterest does and spin up 3,000 servers and spin down 3,000 servers. Or you actually want to move things uh, if there's a lot of usage to the cloud or bring it back down. So a very different environment. And the old model that said an application really equals an application server has completely changed. And so there is a better uh, way to do this. Um, and again, if you look at what the VM was designed to do, you know, if you're saying, hey, how do I get my Mac print server and my Microsoft Exchange server and my custom inventory, Linux inventory app to all sit on the same physical device, we ended up taking that single purpose physical server and turning it into a single purpose virtual server. You know, we took a, an application that was measured in megabytes and we combined it with a guest operating system that was measured in gigabytes and we emulated disk and we ran it on top of a hypervisor, on top of a host OS, on top of a server and that worked great. Um, but we're in a different world right now. Um, and as long as you're willing to give up the notion of running a, you know, a, uh, you know, a Windows app on a, Mac, uh, on a Mac server or vice versa, what you can do is you can do what, what we do with our, with our uh, Android devices today. You just take the application, uh, loosely isolate it, and run it directly on the host OS. Um, so when you download Angry Birds, uh, you don't download uh, you know, uh, a 500 gigabyte uh, VM. You, you download something really lightweight and you don't worry about it interacting badly with your, um, with your, with your calendar or with your phone. Um, and you can do the same thing in the, in the far more complicated world of, of back office software. Um, and by getting rid of that, uh, of that kernel uh, um, and getting rid of that guest OS, you get a lot of great advantages. Uh, these things are significantly lighter weight. Um, you can get, uh, depending on the application, between 10 and 40 times greater density. Uh, Startup times can be uh, in seconds or milliseconds. It's easy to update these things. You can start and start, stop an application without having to start and stop uh, an, an OS. Um, it's easier to move things across, uh, across different environments. Uh, it's easy to move things from uh, one cloud to another cloud. Um, 
And just by doing this change, we're starting to see that uh, we're able to also make this kind of environment work significantly better in that iterative world where you want to develop applications constantly, uh, you want to get lots of loosely coupled components to work well together, uh, and you want to deploy to lots of different servers. Um, and you know, we, we often at, at Docker use, uh, use the shipping container as an analogy, and I think, I think it's really useful here, because if you, you know, look at the way the world used to look. Um, you know, every time, everything that got shipped got shipped in its own specialized type of container. So you, you, know, you, you had your coffee beans in bags, and you had your car parts in crates, and you'd have to worry if you were shipping your bananas next to somebody else's anvils and something bad could happen. You know, it took 10 days to unload a ship in port, and every time you went from a ship to a train to a truck to a crane, you had to unload and reload. And now the world looks like what's on the right-hand side. And to a large extent, that's because you have a shipping container, which is a, which is a box, but it's a box that's always the same size and has hooks and holes in all the same places. And so suddenly we've gotten to the world where in the physical world, 95% of everything that gets shipped gets put inside one of these boxes, it gets sealed up, and it doesn't get opened up until it reaches the end destination. And in between, that same box goes from the ship to the train to the truck to the crane. It takes hours to unload a ship. Um, uh, the people who are ship captains really don't care what's on the inside. And the people who are manufacturers really don't care whether it's going to get from point A to point B on a ship or a train or a truck or a crane. And you can build all sorts of automation, and the world is great. Uh, and it takes uh, often less effort to ship uh, creative car parts halfway around the world than it does to move an application from one data center to another. And that really isn't, isn't uh, the way things should be. But if you take this notion of a container uh, as opposed to a VM, and you sort of do the digital equivalent of making all of them the same size and having hooks and holes in all the same places, a lot of really great things have happened. And that's what we're trying to do at Docker. We're trying to basically standardize this technology so that you can take any application or any component and put it inside a, a virtual container and know that that will run on any server. And know that every container, every containerized component will interact consistently with every other containerized component. In fact, that's what we can do today. Uh, less than a year after the project started, uh, we can take uh, almost any application, uh, build it in seconds, and move it in seconds from a VM to a physical device, from uh, Ubuntu to Red Hat to uh, Amazon Linux, from uh, Amazon to SoftLayer to Rackspace, back to an OpenStack cluster, back to a physical device. And that's fantastic. And suddenly, we've reached the point where application management and how you decide to build your applications uh, is separated from how you decide to build your infrastructure, um, which does a lot of great things. Um, First of all, it means that, uh, that you can actually get dev and ops to work together. Now, I, I love DevOps, but a lot of the sort of DevOps philosophy is sort of this fantasy that says, well, gee, if you can get developers and operators to understand each other, care about each other, agree on a set of tools, and everything will be wonderful. Well, you know, developers like to try new things, break things. That's, that's, that's their nature. And, and ops guys lose their jobs when things change and break. Um, and they like things to be stable. Um, and they're both right. With uh, an approach like Docker and containers, you can, in essence, have the developer worry about what's on the inside of the container, uh, and the operator worries about what's on the outside of the container. And all the containers look the same way. They all start, stop, introspect, migrate, log out, all the same way, which makes it great for automation. It makes it great for handoff. Uh, it makes it great for building these, uh, uh, for doing things like continuous integration, continuous development. You know, as, a, as an example, um, one of the early users of Docker was eBay. And they wanted to ship code uh, uh, very frequently throughout the day. Uh, but they were in an environment where it took weeks to go from development through to staging to production, et cetera. They, you know, the developer would get things working on their laptop. They'd push it to staging, and it would break. And they didn't know why. People would point fingers at each other. And then they'd move it from uh, testing uh, to, uh, to staging. And again, things would break. They'd point fingers. From staging to production, it would break. Fingers pointed. They tried to scale it out in production. Fingers pointing, things would break again. Uh, and they said, hey, you know, we want to implement a rule that says if you uh, point fingers, we'll cut it off. But that only worked 10 times. Uh, and then they had to come up with a new, new solution. With Docker, uh, it literally takes uh, minutes from the time the developer pushes a button, commits code, to the time it's running in production. Um, and that works, and it gets pushed, goes through automated, product, automated testing, goes to production. 90% of the time it works, and then 10% of the time when it doesn't work, it's really clear whether the problem was inside the container and the developer needs to fix something, or outside the container. Uh, and ops needs to change something. And we see that throughout. So suddenly, having, having made this, this change, we are seeing uh, you know, a, a real transformation in the industry. Um, uh, Docker just uh, passed its uh, 2 millionth download 
a couple days ago. Uh, if you uh, go out into the world, you'll, you'll see that you know, Red Hat, Google, uh, Amazon, uh, um, uh, Yandex, Baidu, uh, everybody is starting to jump on this bandwagon of creating an, an ecosystem that works that is as flexible and dynamic as, uh, as the minds of the developer. And uh, we're very excited about it. Uh, looking forward to working with uh, uh, our friends in the industry, including Intel. Um, and if you'd like more information, here you can go. Thank you.